Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Resolution Foundation event. My name is Torsten Bell. I'm the Chief Exec of the Foundation. Um, uh, we're here to talk about inflation, which we've all spent quite a lot of time talking and thinking about over the last year due to paying it. The, um, uh, and in particular, the, how inflation in a country that's experienced because in large part of a significant terms of trade shock should affect how we think about that inflation, how we experience that inflation, and in terms of what policymakers should do about that inflation. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, the best person to talk about that is someone that thinks about terms of trade shocks and about trade in general. And there aren't loads of serious trade economists in the UK um, uh, who then has to decide what policymakers should do about that inflation. And we've got exactly that person today, who's Dr. Swati Dinga, who's an external member of the Monetary Policy Committee uh, and a professor at the London School of Economics and a collaborator with the Resolution Foundation on the Economy 2030 Inquiry, our big project on the future of the UK economy. So we are very excited to have Swati with us today for her first speech as an external member of the Monetary Policy uh, Committee. The, um, after you've heard uh, Swati's reflections. We're going to hear from Lizzie Burden, who's a UK correspondent at Bloomberg TV. And as far as I can work out, always on Bloomberg TV, producing some content whenever you turn it on, which does make me slightly worry about her lifestyle choices. But we've all made errors uh, in life, so this just goes on her one. And then hopefully we're going to hear from you either through questions or through some polls. If you go onto Slido, it's hashtag inflation crisis, you can, put, you can put your questions in there. Please do that uh, now. They um, hopefully reflect on some of what Swati has to say to us, but then also feel free to ask questions about anything in the broad space. So that is our plan um, this morning. Hopefully by uh, quarter to 11, we will have solved how Britain copes with the terms of trade shock, what the Bank of England should do next, and how it's all going to be fine. That is the plan. So Swati, over to you. Thanks. I'm just going to test the screen first before I start. You are on. OK, brilliant. So let me actually start with saying one thing, which is I'm going to immediately counter what Torsten just said. The one, no matter which side of Brexit you're on, one really great thing that has happened is we've suddenly got a whole bunch of people who do work on international economics. And the best example is the Resolution Foundation did not do very much trade. No, thanks for the reminder. Now we have Emily and Sophie here producing some of the best research that's coming out. So I don't think I'm going to buy the argument that okay. I'm the only trade economist here. <laughs> okay, so let me start with talking about um, some of the work that we've done recently to think about the terms of trade shock and how we might think about how that's transmitting across the domestic economy. This is joint work with Jack Page, who's here with me, and also uh, Oliver Davies, who's just joined us two days ago and we have worked him 24 hours a day for those two days mm -hmm. to make sure we can produce this. So let me go on to the talk. Now inflation during the terms of trade shock. So this is the picture from the ONS. And what it gives you is a sense of scale about how big the terms of trade shock is. So what is this showing you? Typically, we think of GDP, real GDP, as a measure of purchasing power. But if a lot of what you're buying from abroad is suddenly becoming more expensive, then that's not really the right measure of purchasing power for stuff that you buy from abroad. And what this is showing you is that in the 1970s, of course, we had the largest terms of trade deterioration that we've seen for a very long time. And if you go further and further, what we're experiencing at the moment is almost at that scale, not quite. It's not as big as that, but it is still a very substantial terms of trade loss. So with that in mind, and I think that's actually very important to reiterate all the time, because this is not something that has come sort of from our own making necessarily. These are external factors that we've had to bear for the reason that we are reliant on imports from abroad. So from here, what I'm going to show you next is how we're going to be able to account for a lot of what's happening on the terms of trade losses in terms of sort of mapping that onto inflation. And this is going to be the thematic argument for what I'm going to use. What we're going to try and do is to say that if you're thinking of, for example, I'm going to start with a simple example so you can wait. And I'm going to go through everything on that slide so don't feel like you suddenly need to read everything within a second. So think of sliced white bread. An 800 gram loaf of sliced white bread, according to the ONS, in January 2022 cost 108 pence. If you move over to January 2023, that same you know, loaf of bread, we don't think there's that, that there's been terribly 
you know, some big improvements in quality in it. It's just very much the same item. And what it looks like now is that it's got a 30% bread price inflation in it. So the price is around 139 pence in the consumer price data. Well, if you were somebody who is used to looking at international trade data from some time ago when supply chains were not that important for the global economy, what you would then say would be, well, most of the sliced white bread that we buy in this country as consumers comes from various supermarkets, is generally domestically produced as a consumer. I don't really go buy it from abroad. And in that case, you might look at that and say this is all purely domestically generated inflation. But of course, most of us understand that that's not the case anymore. And what is the case is that a lot of what goes into bread making is actually coming from abroad. And it's not just simply coming from abroad that the wheat flour is being possibly imported from abroad. You're most likely also buying the wheat flour domestically. But that wheat, which is being traded in global markets, is a critical element to make that wheat flour and therefore also to make bread. So everywhere what we're going to end up seeing is that for even final consumer items, which we usually think of as you know, purely sort of domestically made items, really have a huge imported content in them. And we need to take into account if we want to understand what the terms of trade shock today looks like. So let me then go on to saying, how do we account for that? So I'm going to start with saying, suppose you think of a price of a loaf of bread. I can think of that just by very, very simple accounting exercise, that whatever goes into the price that I charge as a seller is going to depend on what my unit costs of producing that loaf of bread are. And they're going to depend on what the profit margin I want to retain for myself as a retailer are. So once I do that, I can start accounting for what the unit costs per loaf of the bakery are. And what are they going to depend on? Well, they're going to depend on the wheat flour, the palm oil, the electricity, the staff cost per loaf of that bakery. All of that accumulates up. And what is great about some of the national supply use tables in the UK is that we can trace out how much bakery items depend on wheat flour, how much they depend on electricity, palm oil. Typically, palm oil is going to be imported from abroad. So that's going to be a direct import by the person who's the bakery that's making the bread. But the other items like wheat flour are not something which necessarily the bakery is going to produce on its own. What it's going to do is typically go to a domestic mill and buy it from there. And if you do that, well, then the imports are actually showing up in the unit cost of domestic mill as opposed to the direct sort of import share that you observe with the bakery. So we can keep accounting for things like that. Let me get to, of course, the crucial input in here, electricity. This is, you know, which product in the modern world today is made without electricity. We've got to think about that when we start thinking about how broad-based the price impacts of any kind of terms of trade loss that particularly impacts electricity production are. And therefore, all of this is just going to start accumulating up till we get to the point that the natural gas shows up on, you know, the, maybe the second and the third part of that picture. And the wheat shows up in the first part. Wheat also, of course, depends on fertilizer costs and so on and so forth. But we don't want to account for that because that's something that we're buying as a product from abroad. I'm not going to be counting the costs of what the importers who are selling to me are. We just want to account for what is in domestic supply chains, that imported content. So before I go on to the results, I'm actually going to pause so that you can absorb some of these things and so I can remember to do what I had originally set out to do. So I have, for a year, been working with, Econ with the Resolution Foundation. It's a joint collaboration between the Center for Economic Performance and Resolution Foundation to be able to say how should, you know, how should the UK economy gear up to be a fairer and more prosperous society by 2030. And it's not simply a project which is going to describe some of those problems and diagnose them. We want to be serious about what the solutions are and what the right policy plan would look like. And one of the key things that's come out in the interim report from a lot of the work that different people have done is that the context and the trade-offs that are involved, if you want to be serious, those matter. And the context that we're talking about today, in the context, in the sort of specific topic of inflation, is that we are in a situation where we're not really the economy of the 1970s, 
we do have domestic supply chains which matter and not just domestic supply chains we have global supply chains that are really fundamental to how goods and services are produced and delivered today and we need to account for that the second reason i think the context and trade off is very important and this is probably something which is going to come up more and more as the discussion progresses is that we're not simply you know the us or the eu when we can look at turn to those sorts of policies that were relevant for that are relevant for them today and learn from them directly i don't think we can learn from them directly because the context that we are facing is very different so if you compare us with our transatlantic peers like the us or canada they have a terms of trade positive in fact not a terms of trade loss of the magnitude that we're talking about if you think of say france or germany yes they have the you know maybe not exactly the same scale in some cases bigger in some cases smaller depending on which european country you're thinking of you're going to get a very sort of you're going to get the terms of trade losses that we're seeing but what you're not going to get is the decade of stagnation productivity stagnation that economy 2030 is all about and i hope that's the sort of context and you know sensitivity for the trade offs that are involved that you're going to think about what i'm presenting you next So <clears throat> so let me go on from there to showing you a number of graphs and we can have further discussion depending on what you might find interesting which is that let me show you the sort of left panel your left uh picture which has three different colors in it so this is showing you what directly is imported in the CPI basket This is not something that actually comes out from the CPS statistics because they don't typically distinguish between domestic and imported varieties. But what we know from the supply use tables is for each different item that's there in those records, what share is dim- is domestically produced, supplied and what share is imported. So that's about a fifth of the CPI bus of the value of the CPI basket. If you look at energy this is the number that's that you typically be used to hearing which is that you know if i look at what the energy bills of a partic- of a typical household are in the uk that's somewhere between 3 and a half to 4% and that's what this is showing you that little sliver of yellowish green and that big chunk there which is a, over three quarters of the cpi basket in terms of value that's all domestically produced items or at least domestically produced if you look at them at the outset like sliced white bread so we can now say okay let's go and dig into the national supply use tables and try to see how much of this domestic supply that we're seeing can be attributed to for example wheat that's coming from possibly <coughs> ukraine and which has now been severely sort of disrupted or seen massive inflation in or how much can be attributed to what is being spent on say compensation of employees how much is being spent on taxes how much is being spent on other imported inputs all the various ones that you can think of and then whatever is left over after we've accounted for all of these different costs that go into making bread what is left over we're going to just say well that's gross operating surplus in principle is it pure profits not necessarily because that those same profits can be used to finance other investments so we can't distinguish whether something is pure profit margins or whether something is in fact profits being used for further investments but that's as best as we can do from the supply use tables so why the focus on supply use tables could we not have used other things to be able to inform this sort of exercise i think not for the reason that this is what is the nationally representative um description of the economy as well as what then forms the basis for the blue book so i think this is in some sense the best representation of the whole economy that we can get but of course we can discuss what some of the caveats might be of doing this sort of analysis so let me just summarize what i've said till now which is <clears throat> when we think of something like white bread we try to think of that as a domestic product in fact a lot of the content that goes into making bread whether that's electricity or whether that's wheat flour is in fact being very very dependent on imports from abroad and many of them from places that we know there've been disruptions and there've been other sorts of issues that have caused price increases so overall if i compare the figure on the left with the figure on the right the figure on the left only gives you how much is directly imported by consumers and how much can be attributed to energy and then how much the rest of it is being bought domestically the figure on the right instead is telling you how that picture is going to change on the one on the left 
when we start to think about what is underlying these domestic supplies that we're talking about. And a lot of that is going to tell you that, yes, about a third is going towards labor, about a third is going towards you know, profits and quotations. And then the share of imports and electricity and energy, which we haven't quite appreciated in the discussion over the terms of trade shock, is that that number is jumping quite a bit from somewhere around, say, 24%, about a quarter, to somewhere in the range of 40 41%. So we're talking about a fairly substantial share of imports and energy in the CPI basket. So from here, what I'm going to show you next is let's take into account what these shares are. We also know from the CPI in item wise prices, what would be the, the price of each of those components that are going in. This is done at a much more disaggregate level than what you're seeing now, but of course I can't show you all of those numbers. What we have in fact done is to say that, suppose I'm looking at white bread, what has been the, inc we can't really trace white bread in the CPI items always. We can't do it for every kind of item, that sort of detailed analysis. But we can do something else, which is what's happening to the price of bakery products. And from there, what's happening to the price of wheat, what's happening to the price of electricity, Let's give them the share that would typically be needed to produce those items and then start multiplying that with the prices so that we get an answer for how much is the contribution of each of those various components, labor, profit margins, imported inputs, energy, taxes, etc., that would then contribute towards what you see in terms of consumer price inflation. So just in case I didn't say that very well, I'm just going to reiterate what I said which is if you've got white bread and it costs 139 pence now, that includes indirectly the cost of wheat, it includes indirectly the cost of energy, labor costs in the bakery, in the mill, in the electricity providers, um, establishments, so on and so forth. We're going to start counting all of them up. And this is, the, the diff, this is a very different picture that you're now going to see compared to what are, what are some of the decompositions that you typically see, for example, in the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Report, because those are typically decompositions that are either simply telling you where the CPI, which CPI items are rising the most, or they'll tell you things like, can we map them onto a macroeconomic model and then be able to say, how can we think of the various sources of inflation? This is a very, very straightforward decomposition accounting exercise. Very, very few assumptions are made about anything. This is basically cost into, into the cost share. I will flag one thing, which is that we think everything that I'm going to show you today, if anything, we're being a bit conservative in terms of what we think is domestically generated inflation when I come to that. But let me move on and show you first what I mean by that, and then I'll start to point out where the caveats are. So if you look at the, the, bar, the bars which have some lines on them, that's showing you what are the imports that are imported by households themselves. So these are your final imports. And if you lived in the world of, say, the 1960s and 70s, that would probably a pretty, be a pretty good description of what trade is. If you start to move away from that sort of world, you're then going to start to have to think about where the supply chain is using these various inputs and every stage of the supply chain is using it, we must account for that as well. So the green lines, you know, no surprise, huge amount of energy consumption happening, which is really contributing to inflation, partly because of the household energy bills, partly because of the energy that's being consumed along the supply chain. If you think of the pink lines, those are the ones that you start, that, you know, when, when we hear about rebuilding of margins by firms, we do need to pay attention to this pink bar, but as I said, with the caveat that some of this could be in principle going towards financing other investments. The blue bars are the ones that I think we've seen a lot of discussion of in terms of media reports about wages being much higher, private sector wages being much higher than, say, the recent history that we're, we've seen in the past. But what this is showing you is that once you deflate that by the gross value added per worker, yes, of course, unit wage costs are contributing to inflation, but possibly not to the degree that we would immediately surmise from looking at, say, data on services inflation. The orange bars here are then the other imported inputs. By that, I mean imports other than energy that, that different firms need to be able to make white bread. And finally, the 
little, which you probably can't even see if you've managed to somehow get yourself through the snowy morning here, is a little purple bar, which is taxes. We think that in the national supply use tables, those taxes are looking a bit small. So we've done some sensitivity analyses around that. That's not going to make much of a qualitative difference at all, not even very much of a quantitative difference to anything I'm saying today. So if that's all sort of enough absorption of information, let me say, actually, there is a little bit of a problem in some of the parts of the picture, because guess what? We've got this huge pandemic in the middle of it where wage following schemes were on, gross operating surplus or productivity were very hard to measure. We've smoothed, smoothed around that period a little bit so that the picture doesn't look, gives you some level of scale still. But there are other ways of thinking about that, which we've explored in sort of various ways. But that's not going to be sort of fundamental to how we understand what happened to inflation in the last one and a half years, which is really when inflation goes above target and which we need to be able to understand. So let me go on from here to showing you if you snapped back and said, look, maybe the 2020, 2020 and 2021 numbers are much more harder to interpret. We should just look at what happened in 2019 and compare it to 2022. We'd have got rid of some of those problematic base effects, some of the wage furloughing problems that arise. And then we can start to think about, you know, what are the others, what are the sort of more fundamental sources of the proximate sources of inflation. And this is a picture of that. This is saying over these three years, what has happened? So don't get alarmed by the scale. The scale is showing you three years, not one year, which is what we usually think of as CPI inflation. So the lower bars, again, the ones with the lines, are telling you what is final imports, what, what is their contribution. The green lines, energy, as you can see, the bulk of what we're seeing is really looking like a big terms of trade shock, and that's exactly where it's showing up. It's not showing up as much in domestically generated inflation, which typically people call wage growth and profits because that's purely domestic factors, even though there's some sort of level of, I would say, as, as a trade economist, some level of disagreement whether we should even call all profits domest you know, domestically generated or there are, of course, important multinationals in the country. There's also the other issue, which we're obviously not capturing, that if lawyers are extremely mobile, workers are extremely mobile and their wages are set in New York as opposed to London, we're not going to be able to capture that. Though actually that should be attributed to external factors as well. So let me now say why is that important? A lot of where the debate has moved to now about what monetary policy, what the next steps should be, has been about trying to weed out some of this domestically generated inflation with the idea that you know if that persists for too long, it could in principle become embedded in price setting and wage setting. And that would mean that inflation is not going to start to dissipate as the terms of trade shock dissipates. So this gives you a sense of what some of those measures that people are turning to to be able to understand inflation that is domestically generated. And what this is showing you is one of the metrics for doing that, which is instead of looking at headline CPI, which covers a whole basket of items, we will only look at services. And within that, we'll only look at core services, which is to say ones that have, you know, things like airfare have been stripped out because they're very volatile and particularly in this period. So some of the more sort of energy reliant components of the services CPI will be stripped out to be able to give these numbers. And what you can see here is that even for something like core services inflation, which we think is a fairly pure measure of domestically generated inflation, in fact, almost three quarters of the contribution to core services CPI inflation is coming from external factors, which is to say imports, imported inputs, energy use. And that's what then tells us that, you know, whether you were looking at headline CPI inflation or whether you were looking at core services CPI inflation, you really are getting a very muddled picture about what components are domestically generated and what components are externally generated. Naturally, monetary policy can't control everything in terms of external factors. We don't get to decide, <clears throat> you know, we're a small open economy. We don't get to decide what the energy price that should be charged to us by foreign suppliers is. So we have very little control over it or very little ability to influence it. What we do have ability to influence as a government, not as a monetary policy committee, is things like 
you know, the off-gem price cap, the price, uh, the energy price guarantee, and what those try to do is to, you know, shield some of the more vulnerable people from many of the losses that come, come about with this kind of profound cost of living crisis. What we could influence as a monetary policy committee, though, of course, is the aggregate demand coming after the sort of big terms of trade shock. We couldn't have pre prevented the utility bills going up for the UK, but we can try to manage that transition to a more normal setting. And that's really where, you know, now the debate is about. So looking at domestically generated inflation is one way of thinking about what those sources of internal inflationary pressure are. But they're very, very, some of these very sort of commonly used metrics are really contaminated by some of these international indirect supply issues that we've had to deal with because of domestic supply chains that, again, are reliant on global supply chains. So let me conclude now uh, in terms of sort of four points that I want to be able to convince you of, which is that I am an academic. I do give lectures, so you'll just have to deal with that, which is energy and other import shares compared to what you might think of as, you know, a quarter of the final consumption basket depends on them. Actually, if you start counting up how much the other items which are not bought abroad, but which are bought domestically, at least that number is going to go up by 16 percentage points. That's not a trivial number. We're talking about almost two thirds higher shares. So the second thing I think you should pay attention to here is that one of the key issues that one deals with is that is CPI inflation broad based? Are the price impacts being felt across a whole bunch of different items? Or was it something which was very, very contained to the energy sector? And we might have very different <clears throat> monetary policy reactions based on whether it's in a particular sector or it's in the whole economy. And I think what this tells you is that at the very outset, we should not expect it to stay within a particular sector because it's a sector which has really huge supply linkages to other sectors. And therefore, it isn't that surprising that the energy and other imports have had broad-based impact on, the CP on all CPI items, including services. The second point sort of I want to make is that if you look at even till sort of pretty much the end of 2022, about 70% or rather 7 percentage points of the average 10 percentage point of CPI inflation can be attributed to the energy and imports use as well as the, the direct imports that consumers do. So domestically generated inflation, we're still talking about something which is below three percentage points. We think, if anything, most of what we've done, the balance of it is very much skewed towards big, giving you a bigger number for domestically generated inflation because we want you to be conservative about it. The sort of big thing I want to point out from that is this is a huge terms of trade loss, something that we have just not seen in the history of the MPC before. This is really an unprecedented terms of trade crisis. This has no parallels really with anything. And because the nature of the economy has changed so much, being able to just extrapolate from the 1970s experience is very difficult and really fraught with a lot of problems in itself. The third thing I want you to take away is that there is domestically generated inflation that we can see. Some of it, if you break it down by wages and by profit margins, they are going to co-move and sometimes they're going to counteract each other. So if you're only focused on looking at wage growth and wage inflation and trying to understand what the CPI inflation dynamics would be, you're basically looking at what should be a sufficient statistic for the division of the terms of trade loss, not so much what the aggregate economy, what the average is happening, what's happening to the aggregate economy in terms of the terms of trade loss. So this is really about the division, as trade economists put it. Where is the division of the gains from trade going? Who are the winners and the losers? That's what this metric is a much better measure of than, say, what are the aggregate terms of trade gains or losses in this case. The final point I want to make is we've looked at various measures, core services, core services, you know, and we're happy to do others if you, if you feel like you have better suggestions on that. And roughly about 60 to 75 percent share is still coming from energy and imported inputs. And if you look at what the contribution of headline CPI from those numbers is, 
that's somewhere in the middle of that. So we're not gaining that much more information about domestically generated inflation from these measures compared to, core infl uh, to, compared to just the headline inflation measure. So I want to stop by saying, yes, I'm a trade economist. And I think the past four decades of international economics has sort of informed us that that era when we used to look at final exports and imports is long gone. Domestic and global supply chains really matter, and they really matter in terms of how we think about inflation as well. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Swati. Um, I told you you were going to learn something. Who saw wheat flour and palm oil coming? Uh, but you've learned a lot about them. I think actually that was a case study in why when you've got external members of the Monetary Policy Committee, there are advantages from them not all coming from a traditional uh, macro background. Because I mean, I definitely learned lots from that. There's lots of things we should um, pick up on them. But the, um, it's not just because we happen to be going through your particular kind of shock right now but that was there's was lots of food for thought uh, in there but before we do that Lizzie over to you. Um, well thanks Torsten for having me back um, it's really such a fascinating moment to be having this discussion between two Bank of England dis uh, meetings ahead of the budget next week um, and a day after Catherine Mann spoke to Bloomberg TV yesterday at the other end of the monetary policy spectrum, you've also had the Fed and the ECB pointing to further aggressive action. But I'm really keen today to probe you, Swati, on um, how it can be that you and Catherine can be sat on the same committee looking at the same data and reach sort of different conclusions. And I think you've given us a bit of that uh, today. I would first like to second what you just said, though, Torsten. Um, I started out in journalism on the trade beat. So um, your expertise really is valued on the Monetary Policy Committee. Um, and it's great. It's really a privilege to be here for your first speech um, in public as an MPC member. Um, you've made clear what a tricky moment it is for policymakers, both at the Bank of England, but also at the Treasury, as you're trying to tackle the twin issues of inflation and potential recession while attempting not to make either worse. Central bankers seem to be split into two schools of thought. On the one hand, tighten aggressively now to get in control of inflation expectations, or on the other, be wary that inflation can tame itself by weighing on demand. But when you look at the data, it's perhaps understandable how Catherine Mann can fall into the first camp and you and Silvana Tenreiro can fall into the second, and indeed why the governor seems to have a foot in both. Um, on the one hand, the latest PMI data for February have improved sharply. Consumer and business confidence is rising, even if from lower levels. New car registrations were up last month, and the British Retail Consortium says that February was better than feared. So our economists at Bloomberg Economics reckon that a recession is now touch and go. And indeed, it's not just in the UK. The Eurozone's composite PMI last month was the highest for eight months as was the latest global PMI. And so this is the backdrop as inflation is proving stubbornly high, even if it's falling, and the labour market stayed robust. And for a brief moment this morning, uh, the markets were fully pricing a peak rate of 5% in November, up from 4.3% five weeks ago. On the other hand, growth, as you suggest, hasn't taken a material hit yet. Wholesale gas prices are falling. Gauges constructed by Bloomberg Economics suggest that monetary policy, as you would say, is already working through the system. And indeed, uh, as even the committee's former arch hawk, Michael Saunders, told us on Bloomberg Radio last week, the impact of jumbo hikes is already especially evident in falling house prices. So even he says it's time to slow the pace of hikes to 25 basis points. Um, the other former arch arch hawk, Andy Haldane, chief economist, uh, told Bloomberg today in an interview that the bank should move more cautiously now. So you're uh, getting more into your camp. Um, and former, another former Bank of England policymaker, Danny Blanchflower, uh, has told us that collapsing house prices will force the Bank of England to pivot to rate cuts. So it all raises various questions that I want to put to you. Um, at December's Monetary Policy Committee meeting, you dissented, along with Silvana Tenreiro, of keeping bank rate on hold at 3%, and then again last month in favour of keeping it on hold at 3.5%. Both times you've cited that the economy remains weak, there are signs that the downturn is starting to affect the labour market, and that the lags in the effects of monetary policy have meant that previous jumbo hikes were yet to take 
hold fully. So I wonder how encouraged you've been by the latest um, indicators on growth that I've mentioned. And I wonder also where you see the neutral rate. The bank's latest market participant survey, the MAPS survey, suggests the neutral rate is 3%. So I wonder, Swati, whether you agree with that number. Um, whether we're already in over-tightening territory and what you would need to see in the data to vote for a cut to interest rates. Secondly, while some of the data sets show that house prices are falling, Halifax has reported the fastest rise in house prices since June. Some of your colleagues on the MPC argue that the housing market was long due a correction, so for now they're not concerned. And Catherine Mann told us yesterday that she actually sees signs of a revival. So I wonder how much the housing market is dominating your thinking on rates, how far you see house prices falling, and our, our economists at Bloomberg Economics expect a 10% drop from their 2022 peak. So I wonder whether that correlates for you. Other modelling by Bloomberg Economics shows that the economy may have become less sensitive to interest rate changes, meaning that the impact of hikes might take longer to feed through than in previous decades uh, due to the shift in the composition of mortgage lending, lower debt levels and higher deposits, which would suggest that rates need to stay higher for longer. So I wonder how much you think that the transmission mechanism has changed during the pandemic, because that again appears to be a key point of difference between you and Catherine Mann. Silvana Tenreiro says that just a fifth of previous rate rises have fed through to the economy. I wonder whether you agree with that assessment. Um, turning to next week's budget. Um, There's a lot of questions here. I'm getting <laughs> feelings like my blood pressure is rising. It is kind of my job. To uh, I, I've heard rumours of this. Is this what <laughs> I heard journalists ask questions. Go on, get going. Sorry. Um, I also wonder your view on pay settlements um, with the unions. I, I wouldn't expect you to comment on what the Chancellor should do. Um, but if we take the Resolution Foundation's suggestion that... As you should. He will need to find £5 billion to top up wages by 2% this year to end the strikes. I wonder how worried you'd be about this adding to inflation, which has been, of course, the reason that the government's been citing um, for not giving in to union demands. Dawson, cover your ears. Andrew <laughs> Bailey has um, warned that big increases in public, say, public sector pay would add to inflation unless they were offset by tax increases. So I wonder how worried you are about the risk of a wage price spiral. And finally, forgive me, Swati but um, I'm going to have to ask you about the B word. Um, we're focusing today on the terms of trade shock from the rise in energy prices resulting from the war in Ukraine and the disruption of supply chains in the wake of the pandemic. But of course, the other terms of trade shock in the UK in recent years has been Brexit. Before you joined the committee, you wrote a paper on Brexit with the Resolution Foundation in June 2022. Your expectation then was that Brexit's aggregate effect would be to reduce household incomes as the result of a weaker pound, lower investment and trade, and over the longer term structural changes to the UK economy as capital and labour adjusted to the new trading arrangements. In the latest monetary policy report, the bank estimated that the level of potential supply would be at the end of its forecast 4.5% weaker than expected at the time of the November 2021 report, so the official outlooks worsened. And I wonder for you whether you think the impact purely of Brexit um, is better or worse than you predicted before joining the MPC. Yesterday, Catherine Mann warned that the pound could weaken further, feeding into inflation. I'd be interested to hear whether you agree with that, especially given today your emphasis on imports as a driver of inflation. But um, I realise that everyone else will have questions as well for Swati. <laughs> no, no, that's good. That's great. Thank you very much indeed, Lizzie. Lots of... Excellent journalism. I think we should weave those through because we're covering a lot of ground there on uh, the direct stuff on the speech and then the um, some of the policy questions. So why don't we come to those? Is there anything you want yeah. to just take straight away before we then weave our way I, through? I want to actually set the context for how I'm going to take those questions okay. because I think that's actually really important. If my job was, as you suggested, to be the person who is not another monetary theorist who's being put on the MPC, it's really important that I also evaluate the evidence for what it's worth. And, you know, some of the evidence like this is fairly assumption free, fairly model free. <coughs> we can be a bit more confident about what it's telling us. Some of the analysis will have to come from models which put on more economic structure things that we can have debates about as perfectly reasonable people 
things that we can have questions about in terms of whether those sensitivities have changed or whether they've moved in different directions. And I think, unfortunately, there is no straightaway answer saying this is right and that is wrong. There is an element of judgment going in here and there's an element also of data fog, as Paul Krugman sort of recently called it, going on. That, you know, if, for example, response rates in the labor force survey have fallen to the levels that they have, how reliable is that and how much we can be certain about what we're picking up from there is in fact really data. Of course, there have been huge revisions as well. We're still below pandemic in terms of consumption, in terms of various other metrics which matter for how things are going to evolve in the future. So I'm, I'm, I want to sort of set that there from the beginning because that's naturally going to guide how we start to think about and how we evaluate what we're you know, what are sort of conventional rules of thumb either in monetary policy or what we take to be givens in terms of sort of years gone by when data was better, was better quality. Okay, that being said, one more okay. thing to lay the groundwork and then I'll move on, which is, um, I think it's fairly well established that monetary policy comes with lags. Even the papers that are more recently saying that those lags have become shorter in certain cases, really we're still talking about a year or more. So we're not talking about that today if interest rates are increased, tomorrow inflation is going to go down and you know before that somewhere in the interim is going to come a, a contraction in GDP. And I think one of the big lessons for me personally, being sort of a new member on the MPC has been that if you start to rely on month to month fluctuations, likely you're not getting the fundamental picture. And I think that, that's been one thing I did learn sort of over the months as particularly so much sort of volatility came about as well. So I think with that in mind, I can start to take the, I think, 14 questions that were asked. <laughs> so <laughs> You've got lots of other questions. Well, should we do those in, why don't we do the big picture first of your argument? and then come to some of these policy-related inputs and the kind of... Cause one way of thinking about that is um, uh, Lizzie's basically given us a good like overview of like... It's like an in-public version of the in-private conversations that will be happening uh, at the committee meeting having its thing. So just on the big picture, the, um, I mean, one way of taking what you're saying is... Um, uh, well, let's, let's, let's just... Is that basically... Team transitory hasn't totally been written off because uh, it's obviously much longer in terms of than people expected when team transitory was happy to call itself team transitory. But but the broad argument is in the UK specifically that hasn't been debunked in the way that the consensus probably broadly thinks it has because the scale of the imported and transitory price pressures is much bigger than we've tended to think about. Uh, and that the residual, therefore, is low, that monetary policy can do something about is smaller. So basically, is this a kind of rebranding of team transitory? Not at all. I think it's saying that team transitory should have actually anticipated this because that's what the data would have already told us, that since we're talking about something which is such a basic input used in almost every aspect of the economy, yep. we should have anticipated it would have broad-based impacts. Now, does that mean that the policy stance could have been different or could have been done in a better way? Possibly, but remember the, you know, I have sympathy for the fact that we were coming out of a pandemic and being able to change policy very quickly at that point may have had very severe scarring effects today. And I, I, I think that counterfactual is very hard to think of and not enough attention is being paid to what that would have meant in terms of how we are today because that wouldn't have still avoided the terms of trade shock for us. No, it definitely so. wouldn't. I think most people probably um, um, would agree with that. Here's, a, here's the first question from our audience, which is basically, okay, you've given us a kind of decomposition of what's going on and basically a roughly doubling the size of the impact of tradables on um, inflation from how we think about it if we just look at final demand. How widely do we think that is understood? And to take widely as, as widely as you want to think about it, um, i.e. Bank of England, but also more broadly. Because I've not, I mean, I've not, I mean, I, I get paid to spend my life looking at people writing papers on this. I've not seen people doing those decompositions actually in any country recently. So let, let me put it in a different way. I think 
macroeconomics is heading in that direction more broadly. Yeah. Which is to say, really being able to incorporate production networks into, you know, your typical standard value-added type function, which used to be earlier. Now we're starting to think that actually we should be thinking more in terms of gross output and how it connects across different sectors of the economy. So I think that has changed. And I think it hasn't yet come to the point where that's become a mainstay in policy making. And I think that will always take time. It took time for us, even sort of in the Brexit analysis, to realize that actually much of the impact is not going to come from you know final imports consumption it is going to come through imported supply which is then going to in this case now it's translating into inflation at that point we thought it was going to translate into possibly reductions in economic activity so i think I, I, i'm i'm sort of optimistic that this is going to change and there is a real readiness to be able to l start digging into some of the data that's out there to be able to understand what are the what are the current dynamics what do you think lizzie how, how much does you know, does the nature of we kind of people know about the large volumes of international linkages in all lots of things? People write books about them, but it's not a it isn't a mainstay of most macroeconomic discussions. And given that you interview everybody, <laughs> what do you reckon? It's just interesting that um, you're looking more at the data to see how it's um, impacting. It's interesting to know that you're looking at the difference between the impact between goods and services. Um, I don't really have that much to add. Well, another way of coming at the same thing is to say. One, one interpretation of this in terms of, okay, how should that change? It's always worth thinking, how should that change somebody who's thinking about this policy challenge, change how they think, is to say um, a load of second round effects have kind of already happened. They, um, they're in there, they're doing a lot of the work here. They, um, and that is consistent with how people were thinking about this six months, nine months ago. It's just the differences you're saying to us, those are already happening. Stop, because one thing that people who don't agree with you on the policy prescription say is, look at the volume, look at the percentage of goods in, and services in the CPI basket. The rise in cost prices is very generalized and therefore stop thinking about this as a transitory form. It's a, that's their main proof point of domestic generated. It's happening on lots of different goods and services. I'm just watching as people are vaguely following, right? People are like, oh, look, 75, 80% of the items in the CPI basket are going up well above the target rate for inflation. Therefore, you've got a domestically generated problem, not an import. Someone's not in good. That's what we're after, positive reinforcement. So one way of thinking about this is you, is you from the dovish perspective, explaining why we should expect that given a transitory slash import driven shock. Yeah, I'm very grateful to those people for writing that because that has also given us the terminology broad based price effects. Yep. And I think that should have been anticipated from the beginning. We should have seen that coming. We, we should have seen that coming. Um, in terms of sort of why we didn't, I think was primarily because we also are very far behind in terms of the data to be able to understand these supply chains. And that's yep. a really serious problem. Because we don't, I mean, ideally what we would have wanted to do with this kind of decomposition exercise would be to know prices bought and sold at every link of that supply chain. And then you know precisely when the transmission, you know the extent to which the transmission would happen. If you also had some information about what the contracts, for example, the energy contracts underlying it are, and how frequently those change, we would have also had a much better view of the transmission mechanism and the and you know the timing involved and whether it should be it's transitory it's permanent we're so far behind and that's i mean i wish i had better i had better answers for you we don't we don't we just tried really hard but there wasn't anything we felt was reliable enough to be able to show okay right another point of clarification on the argument before we dig into some of the what's going on and some of the counter arguments so john Alty, late of Westminster Parish, there, and someone who was working on trade policy. Uh, in Ash, I shouldn't have unfairly said uh, that no one in Britain cared about it before Brexit. But anyway, so John and others were. So John's question is uh, brought is a factual one, basically about what the argument is saying. So he's following you on the twenty-four to forty percent import mm -hmm. uh, share of CPI, the, um, but has got lost on the seventy percent impact for every ten. You always need representation from the, what used to be called the Department of International <laughs> Trade and the LSE because only they will ask you nerdy questions like that, which is great. Okay. So of course, I'm very happy to answer that. So the 40% is the share in terms of value of the CPI basket, how much is coming from abroad, how much is coming through energy. What it doesn't do is tell you what the price increases in those components have been. 
So think of a very straightforward example. Suppose there are only two inputs into bread making. One is electricity, one is wheat flour. You're buying, say, for example, wheat flour purely domestically. And for some reason, suppose we also have, you know, wheat agriculture that supplies to the domestic mill. In that case, what you would say will be, well, suppose wheat flour prices didn't change at all and only the price of electricity went up. I need to know what that price of electricity is to be able to give you a sense of what the contribution to inflation would be. So in that very, very straightforward example, I'm just going to say, well, how much of my costs come from electricity? How much from wheat flour? You know, how much is my profit margin? And if I take the share of electricity and I multiply that with the price change that's happened in electricity, which we know is, is, is dramatic in terms of the, you know, the natural gas that goes into generating electricity, then we would get that 70% number. So just, so let me actually put it in a much more straightforward way that I think is the, is the key point here, that the rise in prices of externally sourced items has just been huge compared to what's happened on domestic items. And therefore, we're ending up attributing so much of the inflation to external factors. Very good. That's very clear indeed. We've got the 40 and we've got the 70. And if you didn't, it's your own fault because that was really clear. Right. Um, uh, and we can't help everybody. Then, okay, let's move on then to some of this diagnosis. So that's like the how to think about this lesson, which I think we've all been educated uh, a bit about. Then let's move on to the things that matter for broader decision making. So lots of it's come from, um, lots of the price pressures come from imported price shocks, as you say, that we have less control over, at least in the first round of their impacts. Um, and you kind of rebranded the second round as pretty first round uh, in how they're actually happening. So let's talk about um, bits where people would who, are, who are don't agree, what are the data points they're looking at and how that takes into different conclusions. So I think the main one people would look at is private sector wages. In fact, we might have a slide if we can bring this up on the screen, although this may be beyond my... Oh, no, this one. Right, okay. The um, bit, but I think these are three chart lines that I think people who don't agree might point to. So we can go use this as a kind of way to think about what's actually going on. So these are, in all cases, they're just variations from the normal, the post-financial crisis normal. So ignore what's on the y-axis. It's just up means like more, down means less. Don't worry about the actual numbers. They're just about variations from what you might think is normal. So let's go through these in turn. So let's just do the blue line, first of all. So this is, this is just private sector, regular pay. It's quite high by anything by the standards any of us are used to who've been working on UK labour markets for some considerable time. How does that fit into your how you think about what's going on? So I'm going to start with saying that, um, let me repeat what I said already in my slides, which is that wage inflation is really a measure of the distribution of the losses from trade. It is not a measure of average losses from trade. And as a Monetary Policy Committee member, we are not, it is not our job to be able to take any kind of judgment on how, you know, how the losses should be divided across the population. So just make sure everyone follows this. This is, you don't care about whether those losses are no. by profits or by labour. You may no. care, but it's not the Monetary Policy Committee's job to care. Exactly. The, um, and so insofar as the level of wage rises is just telling us about that. So why would we care about that? Because of course, wages are a cost into, you know, prices, which we care about, which is the consumer price inflation number, which is our target and our remit. In there, Naturally, if 30% of the CPI basket, as I showed you, is compensation of employees, then, you know, even though, okay, sure, all compensation is not wage growth, but let's go with, say, yep. suppose for a moment, for point of argument, it is all wage growth, then naturally, if it's 7 into 3.3, you're talking about, you know, just about meeting the inflation target, let alone what might come as, you know, other inflationary pressures possibly from abroad. So, of course, it matters. The question is, what do we read in terms of that for policy? So the first thing I want to say is there's been a 390 basis points increase since December. And, you know, I'm preaching a little bit to the, to the converted here because Lizzie was one of the few journalists who did very early on point out that, look, there are lags in the transmission of the monetary policy mechanism. So how much will translate into possibly subduing some of this wage growth if we think that that's going to be important in the future? Then that's going to matter. So, you know, what the, what the very, sort of compared to recent history, what the rise in wage inflation is. What are some of the things that we're finding out? Naturally, this is going to have to be a forward-looking answer as well. This is not just about what's happened in the past and how, 
you know, some level of productivity growth is therefore in our numbers showing that the unit labor costs were not rising as much as what just looking at private sector wage growth might tell you. There's a second component to it is, which is what we're seeing from some of the, the more leading indicators. It's fairly well known that when people look at, say, recessions or downturns or slowdowns, they tend to find that the labor market is pretty much one of the last points in the chain to react to some of these recessionary forces. So in that sense, the forward-looking indicators become actually important in this case because we're talking about something like wage growth, which is a lagging indicator, which is also probably looking back and saying that you know, there's some catch-up inflation. Will that persist or will the next round of wage setting be something else? And I think here, um, a lot of emphasis is, of course, naturally being placed on the strike activity and other pay settlements that you, mm -hmm. I'll touch upon that, yes, on the pay settlements issue that, you know, people have been discussing. But at the end of the day, that's primarily in the public sector where price setting is very different compared to the private sector, where naturally you would be more concerned if there were those sorts of dynamics unfolding. So what do the leading indicators tell us? This is coming from some things like, you know, the REC surveys. Again, we should always take those with a grain of salt. That's my general view on it because they're not representative. They're not nationally, they're not national statistics. That being said, the agency intelligence, at the end of the day, we can't get national statistics without a lag. So we've got to, to some degree, take a cue from these. And from a various sources, it seems to be happening that they think that now it's sort of flattened off wait till maybe the next quarter and you'll start to see on recruitment difficulties and on wages. wages yeah yes okay and you can definitely see that on the if you look on the month by month rather than over exactly. the annualized data the, okay, so resolution but, obviously has already done that i don't have that picture. We, we do have that chart you can look <laughs> so, it on the website there's you want labor market charts we've got labor market charts um uh okay so that's on the forward looking the thing that people would say to you again who don't agree would say okay look we've started to see some tick up in short-term unemployment um, and as you say, hiring difficulties in firm surveys, including the DMP survey that the bank funds with Nottingham University, show recruitment difficulties easing back to something that looks more normal. The, um, uh, so why would firms carry on? Why would they carry on paying very high wage settlements when they can hire more or less normally ish now? Like we're not still in August, basically. Um, uh, the counter argument is, which was on that chart as well, but it's now disappeared. Um, but I can tell you anyway is, oh, there we go. Look, the elves are doing well today the um, uh, is that the PMIs in terms of people's like view about forward looking how grim the next year looks as you say or balance lots of people going from really deep recession to maybe a shallow recession to maybe no recession at all that's what the PMIs are broadly saying things aren't as bad looking ahead as we thought they were a few months ago so and so that's mainly an argument for okay look, you're not going to get as much labour market softening as maybe we thought, and therefore you should readjust your like forward profile of how much that wage pressure is going to disappear. But you're just thinking on balance, your reading is that isn't there. I don't think that's my reading. I think my reading is, yes, unemployment is much lower than what, you know, mm -hmm. in a longer view we have experienced. So you might think that that number is 4%. Somebody might think that that's 4.5, maybe 4.25. You know, take your pick. Those are typically going to be numbers that are going to come out of some kind of economic structure. So we can have a debate about what precisely that number is. In terms of sort of should unemployment being this low immediately mean inflationary pressures? Well, that wasn't the case, you know, in 2018 or 2019 when we were having these same sorts of issues. Or even in that very brief period when inflation did go to some degree above target, um, sort of around, you know, mid 2010s. Yep. And we, we didn't get the inflationary pressure there. So I could actually turn around whatever you've said and say that that would still conform with my view, which is that the terms of trade losses are starting to look like they might ease the pressure that was coming from there. And it isn't that surprising then that businesses are getting slightly more optimistic than they were before. That being said, of course, my job is also to make sure that the upside risks and the downside risks are balanced. And which is why I would say that, you know, I'm not going to simply say that just because the PM, you know, earlier the PMI was weak, it was fine to to pause or to do something else, while now suddenly because the PMIs are looking high, we should be doing one thing or the other. I think it's a matter of being very, very carefully balanced about that. Great, that makes a lot of sense. And that, that gives us a good um, kickoff into another set of the questions, which I'm gonna to come to the questions in a second that people are coming with. There's a lot of questions along these lines, which are basically, 
uh, how different is the UK situation? You know who these people are, right? The, um, uh, the U how different is the UK situation to the US situation in particular? Most of the questions are about the US, but also to the EU. So broadly, this is maybe unfair, but like everyone needs caricatures in life. So we've basically got the Fed, particularly yesterday, saying, guys, we really are going to hike further. We've seen the wage cost data coming in and staying strong. It's going up, guys, and it might go up by half a percentage point, not just a quarter of a percentage point. So you've got the ECB from a lower base. So having not hiked as much over the last year, basically saying, we're going to do further. Have you seen the Spanish and the, some other countries more stubborn CPI data coming in? Whereas Andrew Bailey, who you politely caricatured as like sitting on the fence, foot in both camps, that's a, that's a less pejorative form of saying sitting on the fence, uh, foot in both camps, who is basically saying, it's all quite difficult and uncertain. Uh, one, we've already hiked further than the Europeans have done. Two, we haven't got the strong demand that you've got in the US. Um, and we've got a terms of trade shock hitting us in a way that the US hasn't. Um, so we shouldn't be treating, so we shouldn't be thinking about ourselves exactly in terms of um, the US. But in brackets, I'm a bit worried about inflation expectations getting unanchored. So I've done quite a lot. We'll see how we go. Uh, now, that's, so that's my caricature done. So hopefully that wasn't too painful. Um, the question is, should we be thinking about the UK and the US situation very differently? And there's quite a few questions along those lines. People have, um, in fact, the most popular question for you is basically, I don't know we can, whether we can bring this up on the screen um, is, well, I'll read it out while we wait for that. But is, given the focus on the UK's terms of trade shock, do you think the outlooks in the UK and US are sufficiently different to warrant very different monetary policy response in the coming months? So... I think the caricature is actually quite accurate in terms of the pressures that we face versus what you know our peers face. So I think let's recognize that at the very outset, and that's why I wanted to mention it before, which is mm -hmm. that the context really matters, and it matters even more so for how difficult and how easy those trade-offs would be. So in terms of the US, positive almost terms of trade shock. Consumption of durables was... Really strong. <laughs> As you really put it strong. some time ago, that give them any number of washing machines and they'll buy them. Or ukuleles. Oh, yes, Completely of course. beyond me why they're all buying ukuleles. Um, they still are. Unfortunately, that's not what we're seeing. I mean, in fact, I think some of the reports that we're reading from agency intelligence, particularly on from third sector, from the third sector of the UK economy, are just absolutely devastating. So we're in a very, very different position in terms of how much people are suffering and how big the terms of trade shock has been. Now, you might compare, then say that, well, maybe looking at the EU is a better comparison for that reason, because they share in that terms of trade loss that we have. I find that very difficult to do. And I'm going to give you two key reasons why I think that's very difficult. One, there's a hugely different fiscal situation, different countries, very, very sort of different circumstances about how you coordinate all of that across, you know, and then get it to the ECB and what the actions would be. We don't have, maybe to some degree, we're a little bit lucky on that front that we can think of a more unified setting in terms of the fiscal space. The second component of it is, of course, the labor market as well as the backlog that we have. And that backlog, I don't need to mention here. I'm sure when we come up with the final report of Economy 2030, it would come out much more starkly in that, which is that we just simply have not seen we, we've lagged massively behind in terms of productivity. And, and we've still got that sort of to deal with and put on top of that the pandemic shock. And, you know, we're even sort of more significantly back now. So I think that's a different situation, both in terms of how those wage dynamics would play out. And as you mentioned, whether there should we be worried about a wage price spiral here versus the EU. I think those differences in labor markets that matter in that respect. So I, I find it, and actually, let me say one more thing about that, which is the terms of trade shock in the EU is actually quite nuanced. So, you know, the terms of trade loss for France has been less than what we've seen for Germany. So we're talking about sort of very heterogeneous elements within even the EU. Due to their energy mix being quite Yeah, different. due to the energy mix and due to the sort of sources of where that energy is coming from. So, so I feel like just extrapolating from any of those situations is really, really sort of going to be suboptimal from the point of, your, point of view of what our economy should, should see in terms of optimal policy. Very good. Do, what, what's your view on this? You interview people sometimes not from the UK. <laughs> so do you think we, I, mean, I, 
A lot of the monetary policy discussion does talk as if all the countries concerned are the same. Uh, quite a lot. I mean, they go to the same conferences. Everyone's hanging out at Jackson Hole. Or they go to the same conferences. You can w literally watch the kind of tide of the consensus rippling out across central banks, even when different countries' data is showing different things. Or am I being unfair? Well, I do notice that you've dodged my bait on the B word. Um, but that is We're gonna come, we, we are going to come back to Brexit, we'll don't worry. <laughs> but it does partly, um, you know, contribute to why we have a different experience of other European mm -hmm. countries. So I think that's an important point to make. But I can see why, you know, as is often said, that we inherit um, the same, some of the problems that the US is facing, some of the problems that the Eurozone is facing, and then why perhaps you're all so divided on our committee at the Bank of England. I mean, one way of, so let's be fair to the people that say there's a, um, you know, you can't ignore what's happening in other countries. So some people would say, I think, and Cafe Man said this here a few weeks back, which is, okay, we've got some global inflationary pressures. Lots of people have got high inflation, although for different reasons, as you're highlighting. Um, uh, that means everybody else is hiking rates right now. We're going to get further rises from the ECB and the Fed. That is going to push down the pound, all else equal, and push up inflation, the, of, of the kind of inflation that you've been showing us today. And so even if our domestically generated inflation doesn't point to needing higher rate rises, the exchange rate is a really just important mechanism for how inflation actually turns up in a globalised economy, particularly a small open one. So we haven't got any choice anyway. So I think that's a reasonable point in terms of us being a small open economy and us having a you know, substantial share of what we buy from abroad sort of being part of that CPI basket. So of course, we, we care about you know what happens to sterling from that point of view we're not in we're not exchange rate targeters i think that that should be kept in mind and there was a reason when you know the last time such a shock happened to sterling a massive shock that the uk moved from fixed to you know to flexible exchange rates and that's really what what that's supposed to do but there is a deeper point here about how that might af affect the inflationary process and i'll talk a little bit about that so Bef so before we start thinking about it, let me put it a little bit in perspective. These are rough calculations. I'm not going to say that they're exact. But broadly, if you think that 5% was the depreciation in sterling in, say, the last year or so, the pass-through of that to, um, to inflation would be, if you t take that together with the percentage that's imported, you would get a number which looks a little bit big, like two percentage points. So go from there to thinking about how you should actually think about that number, which is you should worry about what the actual pass-through rates would be, what are typically those pass-through rates. And I think a lot of the evidence does show, yes, there's high pass-through rates, but relative to the source country from which you're getting that mm -hmm. stuff. And there, the yes naturally sterling has depreciated more with respect to the dollar versus say the euro and once you start sort of factoring in all of those various things you start to get much smaller numbers put on top of that actually let me say why you get smaller numbers you get smaller numbers because a large part of our trade is not us dollar denominated much of the evidence that comes from dominant currency paradigms is really sort of thinking about us dollar it's coming from data which is from particular countries, our trade data does not look like that. We don't have good services trade data saying where's the currency of invoicing. We do have goods trade data and it's sort of, you know, somewhere like the US dollar matters, euro matters, the pound matters. Everything matters, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Everything matters, of course. So the 5% is the trade weighted number. And if you start factoring on top of all of those various calculations, you start to factor in how much monetary policy could then impact the exchange rate you're going to get an even smaller number. So how worried as a first order should I be about the exchange rate? I think not as much as I should be about some of the other factors which matter okay, that's as really well. Interesting. And that's a key difference with Catherine Mann. That's a big difference. And, and, and in general, I think people have moved to being more exchange rate anxious from a multiple policy perspective over time. So that's an interesting push against where people have been heading for the last decade. I, I won't I sort of rule out that, of course, we care about the sentiment value that mm -hmm. sterling has, and we all know that. And But remember, temporary shocks need not always manifest themselves in price effects. 
They take about typically two years, particularly in the Sterling case, we think that most of the evidence suggests two years is when you get about 80 to 90 percent pass through. That being said, that's always done with respect to the source country. So those numbers are possibly oh. smaller than you're imagining. Okay, let's do one last question on uh, picking up one of Lizzie's questions on monetary policy. And then I want to do the world briefly before we wrap up on time. So Sushil, one of your predecessors on the MPC, the, um, is, raises one of the other counter arguments to the like, be relaxed, it's like long term team transitory that's going on here, which is, okay, even if that is all true, um, the workers and firms are just still experiencing very high inflation rates, experiencing more unmooring of prices and wage setting norms. And so, so de-anchoring inflation expectations can still happen, even if it's caused by something that isn't domestically generated inflation. And so you should be worried about that because the downside risks of that happening are really high. In brackets, you need to cause a big recession later to get rid of them. Um, and so we should precautionarily uh, raise rates just to make sure everyone knows that we are going to get back to 2%. Their expectations shouldn't be unmoored. I think that's already established that, yes, the rates, you know, r raising rates to be able to guard against inflationary expectations getting de-anchored and so on. I mean, I think that's already built into the policy response that's happened. So we've, which done, is we've done that, that basically. That's precisely why in, within a very short space, we've raised interest rates quite a lot. And the question is, as that effect sort of starts to go through the economy, some of it, in fact, may come in even step changes in the sense that when those mortgages start to roll off, you're going to start seeing, you know, over tight sort of, you're going to start seeing tightening happen at a time when you were not possibly expecting it because it should pan mm -hmm. out. Hopefully, that's something that we can trace. But broadly speaking, I think coming to the broader point about, you know, do we think that, um, inflation expectations matter. Yes, we do think that they matter. We also think that they're somewhat sort of determined by what people see today and now. So in that sense, you know, being able to measure those things is not the easiest task. And those who put too much weight on those numbers, I think, should should have that in, in mind as well. Yeah. Like, did you want me to say something? No, no, that makes sense. The, um, and in lots of, yeah, I think a fair reading of like the long term of inflation expectations is they move quite impressively with short-term inflation rates and therefore may fall over the course of this year as people as you can see some of that I saw the French data yesterday but you can see some countries inflation expectation data already the public looking and being like okay things are calming down a bit but I don't want to overdo it the, um, okay let's leave all monetary policy and then let's do the glow with one last question um, uh, to finish off if I can find it which is basically given that we've got the kind of uh, one of the countries preeminent um, uh, international economists here is basically are we is this I can't actually find the question but it's a very good question whoever wrote the question which is basically look the US is um, uh, keen on deglobalizing at least in some areas if by which we mean at least forward-lookingly wanting less connection with the largest second largest economy in the world the um, are we heading and lots of what you're showing us is guys like globalization did actually happen. <laughs> like I know you didn't notice, but it did happen. All your firms are using it as as um, in, inputs to everything. Um, what's your like take on the deglobalization hypothesis? We don't have to mention interest rates in any way. In answer. <laughs> so then I can be a bit more honest. I think um, there's th there's a real worry here that if we if we believe, which I think many of us do, think that there is a fair amount of compelling evidence showing that globalization was good for things like productivity growth, competition, that that when it unravels will have possibly, you know, maybe not fully, but partially negative effects in the other direction. And what that would mean would be either sort of in, you know, that would show up as inflation, which is what we're seeing in the current episode. It's going to show up as um, reduced economic productivity or activity. I think um, it, it's unavoidable to, to see many positive views of it. So the positive view I could have would be that one thing that wasn't done very well in the past hyper-globalization period was that we did not worry too much about what, the, what was happening to the losers from trade. And fortunately, now we are much more informed mm -hmm. about how deep those scars were. 
we haven't made much progress in terms of necessarily addressing addressing them in terms of policy but i hope that that lesson being learned then will help to sort of allay some of the most fierce critics of globalization to understand that the deglobalization episode might also create these losers and possibly even much more broad based losers than what were very very specific sectors of losses in the past from globalization very good so we should be um that's a generally we should be worried about it what about how much do you think is actually happening i think some of the industrial policy stories that we're hearing big industrial policy um possibly will replace uh, global supply chains as a result and i think that may not necessarily be a bad thing i'm going to take somewhat of a different view on it because i think one of the lessons that we have learned from the global supply disruptions that immediately erupted sort of after the pandemic and so on was i'm going to give an example actually which is unctad used to you know many years ago Remind publish you what unctad is because Sorry. some people are not as sad as us they <laughs> the UN Commission or C I don't remember and what it stands for but trade and development is trade the development. of course John Alty is here he's going to know give us the answer it is few but the key point being there used to be an emphasis earlier about trying to diversify some of the supply chains as well as some of the you know you become a more competitive country by having export diversification and so on and so forth at some point we did forget that a little bit and i think some rebalancing of that may not be such a bad thing at all and it might prevent us from some of the very extreme pressures that we're seeing on supply chains right now so diverse people is a case for diversifying your imports but it doesn't mean you need to reshore everything yeah yeah That sounds like a that very also good means idea. Diversification. It means diversification. <laughs> the um uh right okay look we are overrun so I think we should start to wrap up. I mean over like big picture I hope you've all learned a lot from today in terms of uh, a reminder this is a crass simplification of the fact that globalization did in fact uh happen that the UK is a small open economy being hit by very large terms of trade shock and those big picture it's always worth not losing the big picture like the big picture of what is happening as with is what i've taken away from how we've been educated today where does that mean for monetary policy well i think in the uk context and specifically just for the uk context maybe it's an argument that team transit treat isn't quite dead uh yet and we'll find out what happens over the next um 6 months but i was just going to finish before we all clap our panel or speakers to say if i can take this speech and cafe man speech here 2 weeks ago it definitely makes the case for having independent members of the monetary policy committee who are using evidence to come to different conclusions and being clear about the transparent about the reasons for that in public and then gives the people uh, the staff members of the bank of england the nice position of being able to sit on the fence uh, and adjudicate between those as we roll forward for the next what is a very difficult year for monetary policy making so thank you very much indeed so i'd like to thank you lizzy can we all join them in thanking them thanks I hope you're all going to go home or if you're already at home well done look at your bread and think how much of this bread is foreign right have a good day everyone see you soon